Oh, I don't feel awake enough to do this. Good. <laughs> this Good luck. High energy, 203, incoming. I'm oh. assuming this is your episode. It is. That's true. Because I don't um, remember making these slides. It, that is possible that happened. Do you remember seeing them? I do remember seeing them. Because we've done this before. We certainly have. Second time round. I'm going to try and act as you know, stupid as I did in the first episode. I mean, no one knew that your memory is basically completely defunct at this point. Absolutely. I feel like this will be a whole new experience all over again. Yep. Yeah. So making new Looking friends every day. To it. Some. <laughs> <laughs> um. We did a video, now it feels like eons ago, about color spaces. Yes, absolutely. And someone in the comments said it was the least wrong video on color space. And I'm like, you know what? That's the bar I'm going to strive for today as well. I'm OK. We're not going to manage, because there's more. There's more on color spaces that I want to talk about. But if you haven't seen it, if you you haven't seen it, you should go back. And I mean, I saw it. I don't know. You, I was there. Did you see it? There's or did you just record it? There's, pr there's proof that I was in the room. It is. And I nodded along. You see, did you pay attention? Who knows? Well, let's find out. Let's find out. So color spaces. We talk about this. Again, yes. if you don't know what this diagram means, uh, it's all in the previous video. sRGB in the this, the smaller one. The smallest triangle, yes. P3, yes. slightly bigger. Rec 2020. That is correct. And the well done. Have a cookie after we're done. Thank you. Um, so the, the, the curvy bit is a, a representation of the XYZ color space. Which and inside this this colored bit, those are all the colors a human can see. Yes. And so these triangles form a subset of these colors that humans can see. And the whole X Y Z space was modeled through humans matching colors. So basically, it tells you uh, what happens when two colored lights mix. How do we as humans perceive that? I love I love these graphs like this because they're kind of a joke because outside the biggest triangle there is a load of colors that screens can't represent, which people are yes. viewing this on a screen. Yes. So the colored in bits are a lie. Yeah. Yeah. They're kind of roughly they're like that, those are green colors, different green colors, but but green and the blue colors, you know, similar. Okay. Um, you usually see these because you know, Display P three sRGB. Rec 2020 are about display device capabilities. And as you may know, we have little pixels in red, green, and blue, which emit light. And then this light mixes inside our eye almost, and we perceive a color. So these rectangle, uh, these triangles represent which colors these devices can actually create by mixing the pixels and which colors they cannot. Um, yes, and people at home are uh, probably watching this uh, on Ooh, I mean, what, one of the two inner triangles, I'd say. Like, yeah. It's less common to have a computer display, which is Rec, Rec 2020. 20. But even then, our video will most likely just prescribe sRGB anyway. Um, yes. So that's another layer of confusion that you know, if just because your monitor can display Rec 2020 doesn't mean it will. Because if the media that is input into the device says, hey, I'm using sRGB, yes. it will be sRGB. Yes, we're, we're an sRGB series, yes. HTTP sRGB. That, that, exactly. Cool. <laughs> That's Excellent. the S in HTTPS. <laughs> <laughs> so these three color spaces, as you said, sRGB, P3, and Rec 20, are actually available in CSS now. Yes. So so far, by default, everything in CSS, everything on the web, pretty much, was sRGB. But it turns out, you know, people who like colors want access to to the other colors that are outside of the sRGB triangle. Um, and so now we have this syntax to do that, which is already kind of exciting that we have more colors. So all these, these color spaces are about giving you access to more colors. And uh, Safari actually has support for this. Like in Safari TP, you can use these syntax. And actually, they have this cool color picker thing where you actually see whether the fancy color you're selecting is inside or outside the sRGB gamut. Oh, that's nice. So you, know, you can see we actually don't get many new blues, but some new reds and a lot more uh, greens you get when way more greens. Look at that! Yeah, Whoa. so much green, <laughs> incredible, and it kind of matches with the triangles we saw earlier. Mm. Um, so there's going to be a lot of Safari in this episode because it's it will be implemented in Chrome, but it's not even in Canary yet. So we yeah, can't. credit to them for, yeah, for trailblazing absolutely. this. It's great, absolutely. absolutely great. When you say not equivalent, what does that mean? So you know, I turned the first color sRGB one zero zero 
is as red as possible in sRGB. Yes. We have just seen that well, that you know display oh. P3 has more red. So Ultra going red. full red in display P3 is a different red than the red in sRGB. Yes. Um, I could have put the equivalent number in there, but that would have been work that so I didn't want to have to do. XYZ is the, is the one which is all possible colors. And more. And so more. I so if you put a two in there, what happens? Does the red come out of the monitor? <laughs> and just, 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 there's I so mean, much, too much red to is, even contain within the screen. Even XYZ100 is a color that doesn't exist. Brilliant. So that, and that is actually what we'll talk about later. What does a browser do when you give it a color that it can't display or that potentially doesn't even exist? Full crash. Yeah, <laughs> just like panic. Delete itself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, it would break the universe. And yeah, it's we need to be just... backwards compatible, right? Absolutely. Exactly. So as I said, like, we have these color spaces, which are about giving you access to more colors. But it's all just a subset of XYZ. There is also different perspectives onto XYZ, um, most notably LAB and LCH. And we're going to talk about these now a little bit to explain how they're different. The so, so some of these are available in, in Chrome. Right. Well, so there's the um, there's the other one that's not RGB that we use, which begins with an H. Uh, HSL. HSL. So is that one of these perspectives? HSL. No. Yeah. No. HSL. No. Yes. No. 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 That's great. <laughs> Brilliant explanation. Just move I on. I went Australian and then added another. <laughs> no. It's um, HSL is just a different perspective onto sRGB. So it is in this has the same constraints. Um, like you don't get access to more color by using HSL, but it right. is the same switch of perspective, like that you you go from a a Cartesian coordinate system where each axis is a color to something that has an angle and stuff. Which you do with with HSL, right? Like exactly, yeah. okay. and this will actually happen here. So LAB and LCH are interesting because they are perceptually uniform. Great keyword. So all of these are. <laughs> you don't need me. You're just congratulating yourself. <laughs> well done, Sam. A great keyword. OK. Well, the thing is, I see it thrown around so much. And it actually it seems self-explanatory to people who already know what it means. But if you don't know what it means, it's not self-explanatory. I don't know what it means. So I'll explain it to you. Thank you. So all of these color spaces, all of the XYZ stuff is perceptual, because it is based on humans perceiving colors and modeling um, a, a, a space around how humans perceive it. Like you match colors, and like, oh, this is how I this is orange. I perceive it as orange, and that's how X Y Z was made. But it's not perceptually uniform, which means that you know you have one color and you add a bit of red to it, and then you add the same amount of red to it afterwards. That doesn't mean you will see it as a linear increment of redness in the color. Like the uniformity isn't there. That like it could actually turn a completely different color technically. Um, but it's like XYZ and all the subspaces are about how light mixes and how humans perceive that mixed light. Right. So the idea, if you double the amount of red, you, you as a human would look at it and go, that looks like twice as much red, even if it might not be. No, yeah, in, no, in that's actually natural. not the case with XYZ. So because yes, the, but with these ones, with the, the, with, the yeah, with the LIB and I think with so uniform space, that is the case, especially right. around lightness, where you go, hey, I want to double the lightness. You double the number, and you get twice as bright a color, which is obviously very important for you know, intuition around colors and when you pick your palettes and stuff. Mm. Um, so let's start with LAB. This is the sRGB gamut inside LAB. So every colorized pixel in this graph is a color that is inside RGB, sRGB. Mm -hmm. Every pixel that's outside of these is technically still a color but at least not inside sRGB. Okay. But just like XYZ, there's also coordinates that aren't even real colors. So that can be a bit confusing. You can actually come up with coordinates that don't represent any real color in the real world, and it's just pointless in a way. Hmm. Um, so LAB has three coordinates, L, A, and B, hence the name. L is for lightness, is between 0 and 100. And as I said, so it's uniform. So if you go from 100 to 50, it's half as bright because it's half the brightness value, which is quite nice. A is the red-green axis. B is the yellow-blue axis. It's not very intuitive. I'm, okay. I'm not going to lie. But it is a, it, one of the first perceptual uniform color spaces. Um, so here, for example, you know, we're getting a 40% brightness. On A, we're going to minus 50. As A is the red-green axis, this is a nice green tone as rendered here uh, by Safari. Nice. So, but again, I feel like this is not necessarily very intuitive to use. Um, but as a rule of thumb, both the A axis and the B axis go from uh, 
I think minus 130 to plus 130 to cover the human gamut. Right, OK. So yeah. and then again, covering the human gamut doesn't mean that your screen can actually create that color with their pixels. So while you might have a real color, it doesn't mean that it's actually a useful color on the web because. I, I guess I'm, I'm laughing at it being 130. It's like, it's like why is it that? But a magic number out of a hat. Yeah, but we're used to using like 255. Yeah. Like for which, you know, if, if you were showing, if you show someone outside tech that, it's like, well, where did that number yeah. come from? That's something they just made up. OK, I'm, okay I'll, get over, I'm not, I'll get over it. I'm not it. sure where this comes from. I think it's just, it's just a number. Just, just deal with it. All right, I'm deal dealing with it. So let's talk about LCH. So LCH is the HSL of XYZ. I want, I want to see this in a museum. Is there a museum where there's this it rock? It actually does look like a nice sculpture, so, doesn't it? Was, is this how it was invented? Did someone dig up that rock? And I was like, uh, and was color like, spaces. I found the color stone. <laughs> <laughs> and it's in a glass thing it rotating does look around. Like it, right? So yeah. I, I will say, I don't find this visualization very helpful. It's from Good, Wikipedia, but I. I had to put something on the slide, OK? Yeah, it's very pretty, though. It I is like pretty. It. So LCH is the same thing as HSL in that it has an angle and the lightness. And the third axis here is chromaticity. It's more intuitive because you know we, we kind of get used to like 0 degrees is red and 120 degrees is green from HSL. Yes. Those kind of things we kind of know. Is it the same here, the same it degrees? It's exactly the same. Okay. The only thing it's weird is that you, the value you can use for C, as you can see here, depends on both other values. Like at 0, you're obviously black. At 100, you're light. But in the middle, like you can sometimes go with chromaticity to 130. Sometimes you can go only to 20. And again, it is quite easy to fall outside the gamut which, with LCH, but it is a bit more intuitive okay. to use. So again, we can do you know, 50% lightness, 80 chromaticity, 0 degrees is a nice, vibrant red. A bit pinker here because chromaticity is, again, can change actually what we usually perceive as hue because of human eyes. And when you're saying like you can fall outside the gamut, that's, that would be the sRGB gamut, right? Like yes. That is the, well, you can the, even fall outside the P3 gamut or physical real-world color gamut. Amazing. All of that is possible. And it's actually a good question. Like, What happens if we give something that is outside the gamut? Oh. Um, and we'll talk about that a bit later. Oh, I was going to try and guess. Well, the first thing that's already weird is that there's actually a thing in the spec that I think is quite stupid. Because if I were to, instead of 50% lightness here, say 0% lightness, what would you expect? I mean, I, I would expect it to be black. 0% lightness, it. right? It, it, it should be black. Currently, oh, Safari oh. does this. It gives you a dark red. No. Why? Stupid. OK. Actually, let me explain to you why it is. OK. But also give you hope in that the CSS working group agrees that this is stupid and they want to change it. All right, all right. But I mentioned in the last video that XYZ is the, the common denominator, the one that we use for conversion from one color space to another. Instead of like you know going straight from color space A to color space B, Every conversion goes via XYZ. It's like the source of truth color space to convert between all the color space that are out there. And that's exactly what Safari is doing. So we, you know, we define LCH with, or we give a color defined with zero lightness, 80 chromaticity, and zero hue. And then they just look up the formula for how do I convert from LCH to XYZ? And that's just straight up math. This is what comes out the other side. Okay. And then they look up math. How do I go from XYZ? to sRGB. And that's what comes out. No. And there's a negative number, which Dislike. we know sRGB doesn't do. And so how Safari currently handles that, because how you should handle it is unspec effectively, it clamps. It looks at every component and says, hey, you're outside. Go between 0 and 1. And so that turns into a darkish red. Right, whereas a, I guess a proper operation would be to shift by uh, you know some amount, which would end up with Zero. It's actually quite hard to figure out how to describe what you should do. But Leah Veru and Chris Lee have actually a really good website called css.land slash color picker? LCH. We'll CS put a link in the description. We'll put a link in the description. And you can see like once you go to lightness 100, every color is white. If you go to lightness 0, everything is black. And they have um, dug up an algorithm that handles this correctly. And this is most likely what is going to be added to the CSS color spec so that we don't get a dark red when we just specify 0% lightness. Good. So Thank you, Leah will, and Chris. That will probably be changed and fixed soon. Um, what's also quite nice, actually, I found that in the CSS color 4 spec, there is actually a reference implementation of all these color conversions in a very readable and simple JavaScript. It is mostly supposed to be red, but it does work. If you want to programmatically. Red, red as in, hang on. 
that's an overloaded term in this video. It's mostly supposed to be viewed with your eyes. With your eyes, yep. consumed as text. Yep. OK. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's very clearly written, so you really see how do you do all these conversions, how do you define the color's luminance. Um, if you want to use, if you want to do color operations programmatically, Leah also maintains color.js, which is a library that has all of these things baked in with more performance and actually a nicer API. So that's something worth looking at. I, I'm really happy that they've done this because I I've been reading some compositing specs and stuff, yeah. and it's written in maths, which I don't <laughs> understand. I don't understand the symbols. I find it hard to deal with like these one letter uh, values and stuff. Here's a big sigma. Uh, right. Yeah. I was like, thanks. <laughs> I'll, t I'll take it. No, but and then being able to you know, just find, uh, well, that's what I've been doing with this compositing stuff is going and finding a implementation written in yeah. C or as a shader or something. It's like, oh, now I can understand We know code. It. We can read code. Don't do the math. Give me the code. Exactly. So this is, this is great. And also very well commented, so definitely worth a look. Let's talk a bit about how to mix colors. Because we've been talking about mixing light, um, but CSS actually doesn't do that as of now. Because let's say we have, you know, we have red and blue. What is the color in the middle? You're right. What one? Yeah. So the, the one way, two seven of each, right? Like is it, exactly. Oh, so so yeah. that, that's basically you, you. You look at each component. Like R is one component. The R value, the green value, and the blue value. Are each called components, and you just you you have them. Like you, you what's in the middle between zero and two five five, and you do it per component. And the same you do if you want to do like a seventy five twenty five weighting. So you could do you know one hundred ninety two and sixty four, and the same the other way around. And this is how color mixing works in CSS, and it's actually also how gradients work in CSS. Right. So and now you can tell that, actually, when you do it just per component, the color space in which you define a color has a huge influence on what the output of mixing is. Because you know, in RGB, it's RGMB. But in HSL, it is HSNL mm -hmm. that are now being looked at independently. And a different color will come out of the mixing process depending on in which color space you want to mix. And that is something they are now adding to CSS, where you can say explicitly, I want to mix these two colors. I want to mix them in a certain weight. And the mixing should happen in this specific color space. So Ooh. basically, this says, mix these colors in sRGB, which is the default anyway. Yes, which and is the one we just saw before. But you can basically define, you know, I mean, display p3 doesn't make sense because it's effectively just a subset of xyz. But you could put lab or lch or something in there. Define your colors in one space and mix them in another. So, so it's the when when we're saying sRGB, the the values it takes are not just the, the gamuts; it's also the the perspectives on those gamuts. Yeah, it, yeah, okay. exactly. Okay, can you do both? Because can you can you say, well, I guess there's no real such thing as as lab in sRGB, is there? It's, it well, is. you can you can basically define your colors. The, the way you define the color is completely independent of where you're mixing. Instead of just writing red, I could write color display p3 or, or lab or lch. I see. So you define the color yeah. in one color space, and then for the mixing, CSS will convert however necessary to do the mixing appropriately. So in uh, the last episode, you identified how gradients were. Hold uh, on to that. All right, I'm holding on. So color mix is the result of the color mix function is a single color, which you know is good. That's handy. Um, for gradients, we don't have a syntax yet. They are thinking about adding something like this, an, an additional syntax where you now also say, I want the gradients to be mixed in a specific color space. Brilliant. Hasn't been spec'd yet. So for the purposes of this demo, I've just been creating 255 divs next to each other and assigning a new color to each. So we can talk Do about it. how this color mixing really affects gradients and the color mixing process. So you might remember this from last time. I'm mixing red and green. And as you can see, the, the color space I choose is quite important. We talked about last time, you know, in sRGB, you, you dip to this darkish yellow blurpy color that's actually not really nice. So you mentioned last time that, the, that doing things in linear color is the, is that XYZ? That or is, is basically that... XYZ, which is. I see. Um, and you can see, like, it looks nicer, but actually, you go away from red really, really quickly. Yes. LAB, very even, very nice. Uh, and LCH, almost the same. I personally actually like HSL the most, even though it's neither uniform brightness nor is it, it it's just you, know, you rotate the hue. But actually, I think in ter looking at this, I like it the best. What I really like about this syntax is yeah, if you go to an article about um, linear gradients in CSS, yeah. one of the examples that we'll come up with is um, a rainbow. 
Yeah. Right. And the way they'll do it is by having like a load of points. Yeah. But I think you're saying here is that you would be able to do this with two points. Yeah. You go from like zero three sixty. You go from zero to three sixty, and it would go all the way around the color wheel and keep everything constant. And that's actually really really nice, right? That's that is really really nice. Um. So yeah, this is the the red green comparison where I think you know there is some differences, but overall it looks fairly similar, like not a huge difference. If we look at red and blue, it gets a Oh, bit hello. more different. Again, I actually feel like HSL looks the best, although LCH also looks quite nice. Um, I think it will depend on what your uh, what I mean, your goal I, is. I'm about to say something obvious. Yeah, it depends on the visual effect you're going for. But I think it's interesting because I, as far as I know, most design tools don't allow you to choose yet which color space you want your gradient in. But it it will become a design choice because I don't think there's a clear winner. It, it really depends on your use case which color space interpolation looks best for what you're going for. Yes. I think and we can all agree that the sRGB one is not very good. No. But the, but the rest is, is kind of like, well, Well, now hold on, because we've just been mixing primary colors, like pure red and pure blue, pure red and blue. Poo, poo red, poo we've blue. We've only been mixing. Mate, if you have blue poo. That's an issue. You're a smurf. <laughs> So we've only been mixing primary colors, so pure red, pure blue, or pure red and pure green. Um, let's mix non-primary colors, All because right. things will get wild. How about yellow and blue? Wait, hang on. These are very different. These What's are very on? different. So I think we can still agree mixing as RGB looks sad. Yeah. XYZ, technically uniform brightness across, but not necessarily what I was going for, I think. If I imagine going from yellow to blue, I wouldn't expect an almost white in the middle. Um, All of these are wrong. LAB, I don't like any of them. Right? Take LAB them is e LCH and HSL. LAB Again, is I, not good. It's kind of weird purple in the e. middle that I wouldn't I expect. E. That's OK, a, that's OK. A, that's a different statement. I like LCH and HSL. They're not what I expected, but they're pretty. They, uh, yes, that is fair. They're colorful. They're trip. Um, <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's like there's, I don't even know. Which one I prefer here, but again, I think this, the same advice applies. It depends what you're on doing. What, what are you trying to achieve in your design. Yeah. Um, so I think it's just really interesting that for me, it kind of it, it kind of became clear that for gradients, the color space in which you interpolate is part of the design choice and something that needs to be shared with the developer that implements the gradients, because you know it will look wildly differently otherwise. Yes. Um, Adam's favorite is doing blue to white or blue to black, because if you look at sRGB, it's really hard to unsee once you it actually dips to a bit of purple yes, along, it does. along the gradient. And you usually don't want that when you go from black to blue. And so his, his the method of fixing it in sRGB is like to add, as you said, like an additional stop that counteracts the, the purple shift. Um, I mean, LCH and HSL just go full purple on you. Yes. And so like, again, like. You can see like it all looks different, and people just need to start working with these gradients in a bit differently. It's really interesting to see. Yeah, so the, the, the reason that SIGB is not great in any of the, these examples is because, yes, it's, it's like all of them, linearly interpolating. But the values in sRGB are not actually linear. No, they right? have this gamma correction on top, which yeah. stems from CRT monitors, but is coincidentally also kind of how our eyes adapt to brightness. Yes. So it's, like, it's, it's, a, it's a happy coincidence. But it it doesn't work for color mixing and, yes. and stuff. So most of the time, when you operate on colors, you kind of need to remove the gamma correction, and that's called linear sRGB or XYZ, which is actually in this sense, then in this scenario, fulfills the same purpose. All right, one last thing I want to talk about. Did you notice that HSL has a different text color than all the others? I do notice it. Yes. Do you know why? Because it would be hard to read otherwise. It would be hard Is to read. Is that why? OK, good. And you know yeah. who made the color black? Uh, it's uh, you. The no. No? CSS chose the text color. What? Because that's a new thing now. Um, there's a new function called color contrast, which you put in a color as a first argument, and then you say versus, and then you give a list of colors, and color contrast will choose the color which has the highest contrast to the first color. Nice. Fully automatically, which especially you know in the context of dark mode or color animations, can be huge. It actually has an additional um, syntax where you can specifically define the WCAG contrast ratio. 
Oh, that's And good. it will pick the first color in the list that qualifies. So you can actually express preference. You can express them in the order of preference. Is there a way to tell it to just figure it out from the background? No. OK. Because I think that's quite hard because you know it, there's compositing and transparency. So it's actually quite hard to figure out. It'd be a bit of a round trip. Um, at least. Yeah, OK. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then also, it ends up being you know, per pixel, because if you have a background image, like. Yeah, yes, it would have to be an average across the elements. Awesome. Oh, OK, so OK, It gets difficult. Fine. I, think I would rather have this it. than nothing at all, at least. Oh, for, oh uh, right? Yeah. I'm not criticizing this. I was just, <laughs> I don't know, looking for ideas <laughs> for the next so thing to work on. Here is, um, so it is implemented in Safari. And you can see like when it comes to green, it switches the text to black, because humans perceive the brightness of green much more than the other colors. And I think that's going to be great Like with a lot more color construction going on, this will be super handy. And speaking of that, there used to be a proposal for this color syntax, where you, you take a color and you have modifier function to make a color lighter, like darker. Like the stuff that's in SAS and yes. everything like that. OK. This is not going to happen Great. in this syntax. There's another syntax. But this, right. there's still tutorials out there talking about this. Everybody should know this is not the syntax. It is, has been removed from the spec. This is not happening anymore. Instead, they actually opted for something more powerful. Because it turns out you know, lightness or contrast is not easily talked about if you don't know in which color space you're working. OK. So what they're doing instead, and I think this is a really nice workaround, they actually t allow you to define a color and say, I want to work in HSL. So use the color from this variable in HSL. And then you get H, S, and L as variables that you can use in calc expressions. Oh, to nice. do your stuff. And so whatever you choose, whether it's HSL, LAB, RGB, you will get these variables to do proper math on with your calc expression. So for example, if you're an LAB, you can literally just say, OK, add 20% lightness to my color, and the color that comes out will be 20% lighter, which I actually think is quite expressive. And is that fine even if the input color is not expressed in HSL? Yes, it's it will all convert. Just convert. So if nice. you use the HSL function, but the primary color variable here points to something that is defined in P3 or LAB, the browser will do the conversion, give you the variable values, probably do the nice. clamping if necessary, um, and you can do math. And that will allow you to do stuff like define some primary colors, and everything else could be computationally generated, both the color contrast for the text colors, but also lighter shades, darker shades. Like At some point, I do envision that we will actually just you know, define some primary colors for dark mode and light mode, and the rest is programmatically derived Very nice. from those colors, which sounds like a great kind of future to me. Yeah. Um, yeah, so if you want to know more, this was like a speedrun of what is in CSS Color 4 and 5. Most of it is in Safari coming to Chrome, hopefully in Q1 2022. All right, all right, all right. Who knows? Um, I'm looking forward to it. I am too. So what you want? What you want to? Yeah. I mean, come on. <laughs> say, say your words, and then say we my can get words. out of here.